May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be always acceptable unto thee, O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. Our readings today focus on visions of the heavenly throne room. These are visions that come to Isaiah and to John and even David in the psalm of the eternal worship of God in heaven. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. That's what the seraphim cry in Isaiah's vision. And John sees living creatures around the throne of God crying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. We repeat this Trisagion, this holy, 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 every time that we celebrate the Eucharist. It is an image for us of the perfect worship that God receives in heaven. And we participate in that worship when we come here to this meeting of heaven and earth on the altar. With the hosts of heaven, we abandon ourselves to the praise of God's glory, or at least That's what we should be doing. The church fathers thought that the three repetitions of the word holy were an indication of God's revelation of himself as Trinity, three persons in one undivided being, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And I'm pretty sure that is why we have these particular readings on uh, Trinity Sunday in year C, which is what we're in. Because there are whispers here of the reality of the Trinity. Even though that understanding was not completely revealed to Isaiah, God structured his revelation, even in the Old Testament, so as to reflect the nature of his being. Holy, holy, holy. But today, I'd like to concentrate not so much on the Trinity itself, but a little more on the actual experience here. This is one of those propers where there's, there's so much Scripture and so little time. But if, if we are entering into the presence and worship of God in the Eucharist, then what should that be like? And what should our response be like? Our passage from Revelation isn't going to help us a lot here because it isn't actually complete. The response of John, the seer, is somewhere else in the book. So we don't get that in our reading. But Isaiah's vision is very instructive. We have here um, an outline of what worship is like and what our response is like or should be like. So first of all, Isaiah places his experience in a very specific historical context. He says that he had his vision in the year that King Uzziah died. That's very specific. Now, Uzziah, who is also called Azariah, was a very strong king. He was extremely competent, and the nation of Judah uh, was prosperous and safe during his reign. He was a good king, as far as kings go. But he got a little too big for his britches. He tried to supplant the priests of God by entering the temple and sacrificing for himself. And because he was arrogant and rebellious toward God in this matter, God struck him with leprosy. The last decade or so of his life, he lived in a house apart from the court because he was leprous. And his son, Jotham, took over the actual rule of the kingdom. Not only that, but Jotham's rule won't extend much beyond the death of his father. The shadow of the Assyrian Empire is rising in the northeast, and there is growing fear of a military defeat. Jotham himself will be forced into retirement shortly because the people want to submit to Assyria and pay tribute rather than being overrun. 
Isaiah recognizes, as do many people around him, that there is no king that is going to save them. Even good King Uzziah is sick and dying because he challenged God. Jotham isn't a bad sort, but he's not as effective as his father. And his son, Ahaz, is a very bad apple. Things are going downhill fast in Judah, just as the Assyrian crisis is approaching. Sound familiar? Into this despair over earthly leaders comes Isaiah's prophetic vision of the heavenly king, God Almighty. This is the true Lord, the one who has the power to shape events and control outcomes. This is a king worth following. But the Lord God is also holy. Isaiah cannot even describe him. He only describes the hem of his garment, which then he says fills the temple. Even the holy angelic beings that declare his praise cover their faces with their wings in God's presence. The incense of worship billows out to fill the whole space to emphasize the holiness of the one who sits on the throne, and his glory fills the whole earth. This is not a nice, cozy, favorite uncle kind of God. Isaiah realizes that there is no hope in human leaders, and so he is ready to turn to God in obedience, but he then realizes that he has no business being in the presence of God. God is perfect and holy, and Isaiah is unclean. He has seen God, and so he is done for. Woe is me, for I am lost For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. This isn't just about his language, his lips. The lips um, are more than just what you speak with. The, The lips are an organ of the will, the heart. What we choose in our hearts, we perform with our lips. And Isaiah's heart is rotten. Now that he has seen God, he knows that. And when he says that he has lost, he means that he has ruined and destroyed, completely cut off. Do we have this reaction in the presence of God? Granted, we have the Holy Spirit of God to help us. And granted, we have the sacrifice of Christ's blood to cover our sins. But even so, our convergence with the eternal worship of God in the Mass should bring us face to face with our own perversion and our own putrefaction. The general confession that we say every week, is not just a placeholder in the liturgy. It isn't just a piece of traditional furniture to be walked around in worship. It's there because if we are truly worshiping, we will need it. We are all of us unworthy to be here. It is only by the grace and mercy of God that we are allowed through those doors. And if we don't ever come face to face with that reality, then we have not truly entered the presence of God in worship. But praise the Lord, the story doesn't end there. The burning coal is placed to Isaiah's lips to cleanse them. Isaiah, notice, has not done anything to make himself deserving to be there. He hasn't earned the favor of this unimaginably holy God. He simply confesses his sin, and then he receives the cleansing as a gift from God. But that doesn't make it easy either. 
The image of fire is still important here. Remember from last week, the image of fire. The filth must be burned out of Isaiah's lips and heart. And the cleansing is painful. We must be totally surrendered to God in order to accept it. Have you ever thought of a burning coal coming at your face as a gift? No, I haven't either. But what do you think that the Eucharistic elements are? The bread and the wine that you receive here are the life of God himself coming into you by your lips. And that life is going to burn. How do you think the life of God is going to mix with the life of sin that you still live? It's not. Eventually, it's going to burn the sin out. And if you have never experienced that burning of sin out of your life, once again, you have never really entered the presence of God in worship. Finally, in the very last verse of our passage, God is willing to speak to Isaiah. Or perhaps it is only when he is cleansed that Isaiah can hear what God has been saying. And when God speaks, he is offering another gift. It is an opportunity to serve. Whom shall I send and who will go for us? He's not speaking just to Isaiah. He's speaking to everyone. And he doesn't force anything. He just follows the cleansing with a question. Who will serve? And he who has truly confessed his sin and been cleansed by the gracious and consuming fire of God responds to the question by presenting himself for service. Here am I, send me. So here is the pattern of worship. The only question is, do we follow it? Do we recognize that there is no hope in politics and human leaders? That includes human leaders in the church, by the way. Do we, when we realize that, go to God, who is the true king over all of creation? Does it drive us to him when we realize that there is no hope in human leaders? When we enter his presence, do we recognize our own sinfulness and unworthiness? And do we allow him to burn it out of us? And finally, do we respond to such cleansing by standing up and presenting ourselves as servants of God to do his will? That is the pattern of true worship. And you'll notice that it's something that then expands outside of just an hour and 15 minutes on Sunday morning. It becomes a life. Anything else, anything short of that, is false worship. It's a counterfeit and a fake. And a lifestyle of fake worship is not an offering to God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen.